uh, in your handout this morning is a poem I wrote about a month ago, uh, dedicated to, uh, to men, uh, and I thought I would just sort of save it until Father's Day. Um, but it's not just um, related to fathers, but I'm not going to read it today, but you can take it home, and uh, for some of you men, I hope this will be an encouragement to you. And for some of you wives, <clears throat> my intent, part of my intent in writing this poem was to try to give you more of an inside look at the man you're married to. Because oftentimes, we don't give you very much indication of what's going on inside of us. Um, and there's some, there's some good reasons for that and some bad reasons for that. But sometimes, you may not really understand why your husband does what he does or what's driving him. Uh, well, okay, let's be in, in the message uh, today about fathers. Uh, there's... Uh, very few things that are more joyful at times than being a father, and there are very few things that sometimes are more painful than being a father. Um, but either way, I can say that the, the most, the truest thing about being a father is that uh, it is a humbling experience. And I just want to share with you a couple funny examples of this. Um, years ago, when my son was playing baseball, uh, we were, our team, uh, I was managing baseball team, we qualified for the Tournament of Champions, which is huge in Southern California. And so we were driving down to Mission Viejo, and this is before GPS and cell phones and where you could look up where you were going on that. And, uh, and so I've got this directions, and I am directionally challenged. And we were in this van, and I've got 12, 11 and 12-year-olds in the back of the van. Don't ask me how many seatbelts we had. Um, and, we, and I'm lost. And, and so I'm thinking, well, how am I going to get there? And I, out of the blue, saw one of my team moms in her car driving the opposite way. I quickly pulled over to the left-hand lane, uh, waited for the arrow to turn left, and I started to make the big U-turn. I got about halfway through, and I looked up and saw the sign, you know, no U-turn here. And I just blurted out, oh, no, I'm making an illegal U-turn. And instantly, one of the boys at the very back of the van said, that's okay, coach. The policeman behind you is doing the same thing. <laughs> that's great. And then uh, in about, I think about the first year that we were going as a church, um, Christy wasn't even born yet, uh, but my oldest was five and my son was three. And I decided to do a um, little children's sermon uh, for our few little, you know, handful of little kids that were there. And so I think we were at the Boys and Girls Club, and I had them come up on the stage, and they sat down, and I took out a, a, a smoke alarm. And so I opened up the smoke alarm, and <clears throat> I said, how many of you know what this is? And uh, the four- and five-year-olds knew what it was. The, three, the two- and three-year-olds thought they knew what it was. They saw the four- and five-year-olds raise their hands. So there's the four- and fives raised their hands. Then the twos and threes raised their hands. They all knew what it was. And so uh, I said, now, this is a smoke alarm. And I pushed the button and made that sound. And I asked all the kids, now, do you know what happens um, when the smoke alarm goes like this? And without missing a beat, my five-year-old daughter chimed up real loudly, that means you're cooking. Ugh. <laughs> <sighs> Guilty. Well, the title of today's message is The World in Which Every Man Lives. Uh, in Genesis chapter 1, the world was created. Man and Eve, Adam and Eve were perfect, and, and the Garden of Eden was perfect. And everything was going on like it was supposed to be going on, including relationships between Adam and Eve and Adam and God and God and Eve. And it was just one of those things that you just kind of wish, why can't this happen in my life? But it was going on swimmingly until Genesis 3. And in Genesis 3, you find out that Adam and Eve uh, had this idea that maybe God, because of some restrictions that he had put on them, wasn't as good as maybe he thought he was or we thought he was. Maybe he's holding out on us. And they decided to take some matters into their own hands about their own happiness. And when they did... Two seismic changes happened in the world God created. The first seismic change was regarding our human nature. Suddenly, we had a sin nature where uh, before our nature was we were, we were ready to put anybody else first ahead of ourselves. 
What was important was loving someone else, in this case, spouse or God, more than that was more important than how they treat me. Now it was everything was backwards. Looking out for number one is central in every human heart, in every son of Adam, in every son of Eve, down through all these generations. The second thing that happened was that our world became fallen. The world in which we live is not the same as the Garden of Eden. And God speaks to Adam and then he speaks to Eve and describes in Genesis 3 the world in which each gender lives. Now, we all live in the same world in one sense, but the effects of the fallen world on the two genders are very different. There are some commonalities, but there are some significant differences. Let's look at now, because it's Father's Day, we're just going to look at the how the world looks to a man and how it feels. Genesis 3, God says to Adam, Because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you. You will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground. Since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Now he's talking about here the fallen world in which we live. And the imagery, which would have been uh, made complete sense to Adam, was the imagery of gardening and farming. But this is not just bad news for gardeners and farmers. It is an image or a metaphor for, how, for the world in which men live. And what he describes in one way is things are not as simple as they seem like they should be. And things seem to be a little bit more complex. And things don't work like you think they're supposed to be. And things go wrong that you never imagined would go wrong. Now, I want to look back at the same passage we just read. And I want you to notice some very important things here. Verse 17, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground. The world in which we live for men here is different from the Garden of Eden. There is something wrong with this world. C.S. Lewis calls the fallen world a ruined castle. It's a castle in the sense of God. When God made it, everything was beautiful. And if you go down to the Corona del Mar and look out at the, at the beach and the, and the ocean or go up to Big Bear and look at the mountains or up in the northern part of our state, you see the wonder and grandeur of what was made. But as we live our lives, things just don't work like they're supposed to. And it gets messy and it gets frustrating. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil... Not just through toil, but there's something of pain. And he's not just describing physical pain. He's describing the totality of pain that will be part and parcel of the life that we live as men. You will eat of it all the days of your life. Meaning there's not going to come a time when I'm finally going to be done with this. And then I get to retire and enjoy the, the, the sweet fruits of Eden again. That's not true. It will produce thorns and thistles for you. Now, I have roses in our yard, and we have bougainvillea bushes. And every time I go to trim those those two things, our rose bushes and bougainvilleas, I'm reminded of thorns and thistles. They are nasty. They're a reminder to me of the world in which I live. Verse 19, by the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground. There's no way out, so to speak, from the effects of the fall on every son of Adam. Since from it you were taken, to dust you are, and to dust you will return. Now, there are some commonalities between the the world that you ladies experience and the world we we men experience. The commonalities are these. We do not live in the Garden of Eden anymore, nor will we be able to return to the Garden of Eden in this life. Any expectation that you have that this life ought to and should and could be a whole lot better than it is now is questionable and may set you up for even more discontent. 
Another commonality is that there are problems that are going to be a part and parcel of life. That should, that should be, we should understand that as normative. We should not be surprised when problems come rolling into our lives. The third commonality is there is pain that strikes the very core of who men are and the very core of who women are. And then for both, life is more complicated, it's more complex, and it is confusing at times. But there are some differences, and that's what I want to highlight today. The most painful thing for every daughter of Eve is different than the most painful thing from every son of Adam. For for all of you daughters of Eve, the most painful thing in life for you is going to be relational in nature. Uh, It could be your husband. It's going to be your children. It's going to be the people that you work with. But it's uh, your your father and mother, uh, friends, relatives, relational uh, difficulties and drama strike deep in the heart of every woman. There is something very painful about that that's not true of men. There is a deeper pain for every son of Adam, and it has to do with what we do. What we do. Sometimes that's our work. Sometimes that's being at home trying to do chores. uh, Or sometimes trying to do ministry with people. Uh, We are going to find this very, very infuriating at times and debilitating. Uh, when I think about this for, uh, for men, I think, of, I, call, I think of this as the three F's. And if you're following along in your handout, these are three of the fill-ins on page two. There is a sense of futility. Uh, excuse me, frustration is the first one. A sense of frustration that's part and parcel of our world. Secondly, a sense of failure And third, a sense of futility, meaning, why bother? I'm tired of trying. I give up. I'm done. And the world in which we live, you should not be surprised when that strikes you in your personal life, you feel that way. When that strikes you as a husband, when you feel that way. Even when you're married to the the best woman you you know. This is still inescapable. Or to your children or your parents. Or why try any more at work? Or why try any more with my boss? Or why try any more with my employees? Why try any more to fix things? All of these things are part and parcel of the test of what it's like to be a man in this world. Now, I'm reminded again of this when I go out in my front yard or especially in my backyard. I mentioned to you about thorns in our rose bushes and bougainvilleas. I also have three different kinds of bugs that I have to deal with in our backyard. There are some bugs in our front yard that I can see, like little aphids on roses. Or uh, some little bugs, I still don't know the name of them, that eat holes in some of the leaves on our plants. There's a second kind of bug uh, that I can't see, and that's the kind of bug that gets up into the stem of our plants. We have had several trees that have died because of beetles that have gotten inside the tree, and they worked their way up, and they sucked the life out of that tree. We just had two trees cut down yesterday, dead because of these kinds of beetles that you can't see. The third kind of bug that I have to deal with is bugs that I can't see that are underground, like grubs who want to eat out the roots of the grass outside. Now, why did God allow our world to be fallen like this? He allowed this to happen because just prior to this, our sin nature, or our nature became fallen. And every son of Adam has a desire in him to make life work by what he does. His success, moving up the ladder, being being, uh, uh, effective, getting something done, accomplishment. And God says, that's not the way to life. And so what needs to happen is I'm going to frustrate the central drive in your life so that you will find me. In other words, the curse in Genesis 3 to both men and to women is redemptive in nature. It's frustrating, but it's redemptive. Now, I want to, um, in addition to the difficulties we have, Satan comes along to us, both to ladies and to men. 
um, and he tries to make life miserable, and he does it through what I think of as enemy thoughts. And I want to mention five of these uh, today. Ephesians 6 says, in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the devil. Now, the devil throws out his, he shoots his arrows, but they aren't visible arrows. They're invisible arrows that are shot through the invisibility of air into your mind and into your heart. And they are meant, I think, to do two things. To discourage you and to cause you to quit. Here are the five, here are the five uh, enemy thoughts. Number one, it's too hard. Marriage is too hard. Raising teenagers is too hard. This job is too hard. Second enemy thought, it's not fair. You see some of your buddies going through good times and you're going through struggles and you'll, you can hear that, that voice in your head like everyone said, it's not fair. Number three, it's not what I want. I didn't sign up for this. Number four, I'm too tired. Now, sometimes this means we need a vacation or some time off. But it's my opinion that about 90% of the time when, when a man says, I'm too tired, what he means is, I'm, I'm too tired of feeling like a failure, and I'm too tired of frustration, and I'm too tired of futility. I'm just tired of the whole mess. It's not a physical tired. And five, I'm the only one. I don't know anybody else in my life that has to deal with the things. I don't know any other pastor that has to deal with the things. I don't know any other guys in the field I go on or the, or the, mar my, the, friends, the marriages of my friends or their teenagers. Why do I have to deal with this? These five enemy thoughts. And they come meant to discourage us and to cause us to quit. Now, in our Christian radio world, if you listen to Christian radio, there are a lot of preachers that imply, I don't know if they would actually say this uh, in their theology, but imply that there's something you can do about the curse to make your life pretty glowing. And somehow I shouldn't have to deal with this reality. Now, I have enough trouble personally already dealing with the world as it is, being a man, and five enemy thoughts to add to that um, lofty expectations into my head that are not true. For example, if you're a student of the Old Testament, when God allowed the, the Babylonians to come in and, and take over the land and take 90% of the people to Babylon, you know what the false prophet said to that group? Peace, peace, peace is coming. And they said, only two more years, and we'll be back home in Jerusalem, back in, in the land of Judah. And Jeremiah had to come along and say, that's not true. Don't tell the people that. Because their expectations get inflated beyond reality. Well, a lot of times, I, I don't even listen to Christian radio. Uh, there are a few guys I do listen to. But be careful what you listen to, as Everard said. Listen to, listen to how the Apostle Paul looked at his life. Look at the glasses through which he looked at his life. And for you men, is, are these the glasses you look through also? And ladies, as we read these verses, it's likely that your husband looks at his life in a very similar way to what you will hear from Paul. For 2 Corinthians 1.3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in, in all, underline, our troubles. He hadn't figured out some golden way to somehow avoid all these troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble. His troubles are redemptive, both for himself and for others, with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. And then he mentions the word suffering five times in this passage. For just as the sufferings of Christ flow over into our lives, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. If we are distressed, what a great word, distress. 
distress. Paul, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance. Endurance, don't give up. The same sufferings of the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope is firm. It's an anchor. I'm not, I'm not being driven by the, the, the winds that, that tell me that I'm a failure and, frustra- and the things that are frustrating and a sense of futility or the enemy thoughts. There is an anchor that we as men are to hold on to. Hope is firm because you know that just as you share in our suffering, so also you share in our comfort. We do not want you to be uninformed brothers about the hardships we suffered. He, he clearly, openly talks about the difficulties of this life. And that's important in this church. This is a place where you should be able to talk about the difficulties of life to somebody without them saying, well, you just need to pray about it more. We do not want you to be uninformed about the hardships we suffered in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure. Every man knows what that's like. Far beyond our ability to endure so that we despaired even of life. Despair. Indeed, in our hearts, we felt the sentence of death. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. All of these things are redemptive. To draw us back to God. To reset our hope on something else other than I can make life work. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hopes that, we will, that he will continue to deliver us. As you help us by your prayers, then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted us in answer to the prayers of many. On the back of your handout, the call for us as men is to persevere with hope. We persevere with hope. Proverbs 24, 16 is such an encouraging verse to me. Uh, He says, for a righteous man falls seven times, but the wicked are overthrown by calamity. You hear what's implied in the verse? Of course I'm going to mess up. Of course there are going to be times of failure. Of course I'm going to be frustrated with myself. And why do I keep dealing with the same issues over and over again? That should not be a surprise to me. Not in the world we live in and not with my nature. But the wicked are overthrown by calamity. The idea there is they give up. Throw in the towel. It's not worth it. I'm tired of dealing with all this stuff. Romans 5, 3. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. The redemptive nature of suffering builds our perseverance to not give up, and we persevere, as he says, in hope because of the, the, the man that God is shaping us to be through these difficulties. And then Romans 8, 23. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly. This is my personal shorthand version for how I try to respond uh, from the smallest disappointments to the greatest. I groan inwardly, not living in denial. This hurts. This sucks. I wish I didn't have to go through this. There's a sense in which I should groan, as, as Paul says in Romans 8, but that is not the final answer. We wait eagerly with hope. Uh, when the uh, movie The Greatest Showman came out um, a while back, um, I didn't want to go see it because it's a musical, and, and I'm just not one of those guys that likes musicals. But I'd heard really good things about the story, and I love a good story. Uh, it's a rendition of P.T. Barnum's life and sort of the birth of the circus. 
Uh, but it's really every man's story, I think. Uh, it starts out with him being raised uh, as a very poor, uh, in a poor, very poor family, uh, and him seeing sort of the upper crust and how they lived, uh, the world of the, the, the movers and shakers and those who had money. And there was something in him that wanted to get that. That's what I need. And he ended up falling in love with a, with a beautiful young lady that was from one of those families. And the father of the young lady knew that P.T. Barnum was not of his kind. And, and P.T. Barnum felt the awful sting of, uh, you're a loser. You know, why, why would my, I want to give my daughter to somebody like you? Uh, but he, he had a dream of a circus, and he, he slowly made that happen. Uh, he had to raise funds for this. He had to, to go to the banks. Of course, there was no circus. Nobody knew what, what he was trying to do. He went through a time of getting it off the ground. Uh, there were times of tremendous debt. Uh, there was a time when the circus, uh, where they, where they uh, had their circus, where it burned to the ground. Uh, not a tent, but a building. Uh, he also became famous, uh, and a lot of his wealth at one point in time came from a tour that he made at the U.S. with the most famous uh, singer from Sweden, the, the Swedish Nightingale, I think was her nickname. Um, and they went on tour, and he made a lot of money to her. And the, the movie shows the subtle temptation that, uh, that every man is drawn to, that beautiful woman who, who understands me and knows me and just wants to be with me, free of, from any kind of criticism, uh, that just that the, uh, the siren song of temptation. And he comes right up to the edge of that. And he suddenly realizes that he has spent his adult life in the wrong things. And he's made a mess of his marriage. He's about to lose it, or he could. And he could lose his two girls who are back home living with his father-in-law because he doesn't have enough money to pay rent. And he could lose the circus. And he could be a colossal public failure. But he finally hits bottom, a time of repentance. And in that time of repentance, there's a great scene near the end of the movie where he comes to the beach where his wife is as a humble man to remake some vows. I want to just watch this little clip. He says to her, I wanted to be somebody more than I was. And that drive nearly killed everything he cherished. And she said to him, I only wanted the man I fell in love with. Let's pray together. Father, I pray for all of us that are men that you would take the truth of your word that we've looked at today and that you would encourage us that we are not alone and that the things that we battle sometimes every day are not abnormal and that there's something unique to us in how messed up we are. And she would lift us to a place of hope that you are telling a story through our lives and even through hardship and failure and frustration. You are shaping us. And you still want to use our lives to make a difference, even in those times when it doesn't seem like our life would not make much difference to anybody.